What you gonna do, brother, when Jeff Townsend Media runs wild on you? Have you been searching for a podcast? Do you want to learn from some great content creators? Well, you've come to the right place. Indie Podcaster with your host, Jeff Townsend, the Indie Podcast Father. All right, all right, all right. This is Jeff Townsend. Thank you for checking out another episode of Indie Podcaster. This podcast is made for podcasters and other content creators. Certainly don't consider myself a guru, nor either do any of my friends that will be featured in these episodes. But what we do like to do is talk content creation, pick each other's brains, and have a good time. I'm proud to mention that this podcast is sponsored by Indie Drop-In. Now, let me tell you something about Indie Drop-In. This is an awesome network that my friend Greg has created. What he does is drop episodes from independent content creators into his established podcast audience on his feed, and he shares your episodes to an audience that already exists. Yes, it's like free advertisement and promotion for your podcast. He spent a lot of time, money, and effort building it, and he already has an audience interested in the content, and he can certainly help you by sharing your content. It's great promotion. Go to IndieDropIn.com slash creators and check it out. If you're a comedy, true crime, paranormal, or various other different kinds of podcasts, you can benefit from this. So I really encourage you, once again, go to IndieDropIn.com slash creators and see if you can get your stuff featured on Indie Drop In. We'll go back to the podcast here, Indie Podcaster. So what we've currently been doing is sharing content from three different projects that I'm involved in. The first is Good Morning Podcasters with my good friend Fuzz Martin. We also do some content on Podcasting Sucks. And then in these episodes, you will also hear some content from Podcasting Power Hour. Podcasting Power Hour is a live thing we do on Twitter Spaces. We get a whole bunch of great podcast minds together and we talk podcasting. So if you're a content creator, a podcaster, I think you'll take something away from every episode of the content I'm going to share with you. With that being said, make sure you check out Indie Drop-In and make sure you enjoy this episode. I think it's important that we all continue to learn and grow every day and that will help us become even better content creators. That's certainly what I try to do, learn something new every day. I'm excited to share this content with you. I think it'll be a learning experience for you. Let's get to this episode, and I hope you have a great time listening to it. Good morning, podcasters. Has anyone ever actually promoted it on Reality Records? Today, we're talking about organizing your podcast. What's happening, you beautiful podcasters? Welcome to Good Morning Podcasters. I am Fuzz Martin, your host. I also have the flu, so if it sounds like I have the flu, it's because I have the flu. I saw a question on Reddit, which comes up a lot, about how podcasters organize their show and their guests and whatnot, so I thought I'd talk about some of the tools that are available and how I organize my show. Well, shows. I actually have three, but I use basically the same process for managing all three. Having a podcast means keeping track of a lot of things. You have to keep track of your guests, your show topics, Your show notes, maybe scripts if you have a scripted show, research articles, audio files, logos and other branding elements and design files, audio tracks, maybe sound effects, processing settings, so many different things. And there are a number of organizational tools out there that will help you keep track of all those things, or at least most of those things. And you don't have to pay a bunch for them either, though you can if you want to, of course, but... For some of these, you can get away with the free version if you're a solo podcaster or maybe it's one or two of you podcasting. Some of the good organizational tools out there or project management tools which can be used for organizing your show include Asana, Google Drive, uh, Monday.com, Trello, Basecamp, though I don't believe they have a free tier, and Smartsheet, which also doesn't have a free tier. Plus, there are a whole bunch of other apps out there. There's writer's room apps. There's different things like that. Each of these tools allows you to organize information in their own sort of way. Some have similar features. Some are much different than the others. It's all a matter of your style and the needs of your show and how your brain works, really. So what do I do and what do I use? Well, my main hub for all of my shows is Trello. Trello is a Kanban-style digital organization board. So Kanban is a manufacturing management system. It relies on cards, kind of like digital sticky notes, or in some cases, actual physical cards or sticky notes that are set into different columns, which happen to be a stage 
of the process and you move a card from the beginning of the process to the end along the way and you can see what stage of a project each card is currently in. The great part about Trello is that you can make however many columns you want or need and then you can add as many cards underneath those columns as you need. So for my show, in my Trello board for Good Morning Podcasters, I have these columns. On the far left, I have one called Incoming. That's where I write down any to-do item that I can think of. Any sort of thing that comes to mind, I immediately put it into Incoming so I can get my thought down, and then I worry about organizing where it goes later. Then I have three columns where most of the business gets done. The first column is called This Week's Good Morning Podcasters Episodes. You may have seen screenshots of this on my Twitter feed or on my Instagram feed. In this column, I only keep the three episodes that I'm going to publish this coming week. So I have Monday, Wednesday, and Friday's episodes right in there so I can stay organized and know what is coming up. To the right of that, I have a column called Next Week, which is obviously next week's shows. But it's kind of a tentative uh, list of ideas uh, for next week's shows. Those get moved around a lot, and sometimes they don't make them into this week's shows. But that's kind of my staging area of I'm doing these three this week, and then next week I'm going to do this, and I can kind of see what they all look like next to each other. After that, it's a column called Topics, and this is a full brain dump of any sort of topic that I might want to cover on this show. So I currently have 186 cards in that column. Some are absolute garbage. Some are great. It's brainstorming. So I put it all down there because it might spark another thought. But the cool part about Trello, or one of the many cool parts about Trello, is that it is really easy to grab a card and drag it to the top. So let's say I have an idea that I want to bring to the next episode, or I'm like, this is a really good one. I should talk about this, or this is topical right now. I can drag it to the top, and then it's there for me to see. Also, when I drop a new idea into my incoming column, I will then drag it into the kind of level of importance in that topics column to say like, okay, this is a, a an important topic that I need to get to soon, or maybe I'll just put it in there for later. Like this is something I can talk about down the road. If it's very important or very topical, I keep it at the top or I might even drop it into my next week column. And if it's something I'd like to cover later or when I'm struggling for an idea, then I drop it down to the middle or the bottom of that stack. The fifth column is called social posts. And this is really just a reminder of what posts I need to create for each episode. So it reminds me to post it on Twitter. It reminds me to create an Instagram story and to put it in my Instagram newsfeed. And also any other pieces that I might need to create for social are all in my social post column. To the right of that is my done column. I drag topic cards that are completed into that column so I can easily reference them. Instead of having to scroll through my RSS feed, I can just either search through that or just scroll down and look through. Then the next set of columns are for branding and marketing purposes. So I have a resources column. Uh, that contains a card called Colors, which holds the Good Morning Podcasters brand colors, the hex codes, the RGB codes, CMYK, et cetera. It has my logo files in Photoshop format, in uh, Ping and JPEG and in different sizes and such. I have my headshot and Jeff Townsend's headshot in case the journalist or another podcast asks for them. I need to put mine and Jeff's standard bios in there as well so that I don't need to rewrite those anytime we get asked for them. Uh, but that's a good best practice for you from a PR standpoint is to always have that kind of stuff on file and ready to go. Then I've got a column called parking lot. This is ideas that I have for the show that might be useful in the future, but are on hold for now. Maybe they're too ambitious. I don't have time for them or they'll take more work to put in or maybe want to wait and see if that's something that I want to do. And I have my sponsors column that includes information about show sponsors, potential sponsors, those kind of things, contact information, uh, whatever we've negotiated is in there so that I know and then I can mark off. I've got a little inside a Trello card. You can drop a checklist and then check it off as you go. So let's say I have four sponsored pre-rolls. I can check those off as I complete them and then I know when that's done or if I still have more to do. And that's it. Those are my Trello columns. I also make good use of Trello's label system. I like Trello's labels because they have a colorblind mode and I'm quite colorblind. Their colorblind mode uses patterns on top of the colors to make it better stand out from one another. More apps should adopt this. 
So for labels, I have marketing, public relations, social media, advertising, general podcasting. I've got one for podcasting sucks episodes. I've got one that says sponsored. So I know when I have a sponsored episode, I have done and I have show stuff. I label each topic card with its overall theme, whether that's marketing, advertising, PR, social media, or general podcasting so that I can easily look at a glance and make sure that I have a good mix of different types of topics throughout the week and I'm not just heavy on one theme. It's real easy to do a whole bunch of social media posts because there's always so much news out there about that and I like to spread that out. I have a done label, as you heard, because it feels good to mark something as done and then I drag it into the done column. And it's really more for a dopamine spike than for actual organization. And that's really the gist of how I organize Good Morning Podcasters. In my real life work world, I use some of the other Trello features like team tagging so I can tag people and assign them different tasks, which you can certainly do if you have a co-host on your show or maybe you're working with a producer. Real easy way to say who's responsible for which thing. And that's all included within Trello. And at Epic Creative, we also have it tied into our website with Zapier, an automation software, which, by the way, uh, it's pronounced Zapier. I know it's written like Zapier, and a lot of people get it wrong because of that single P, but I reached out to Zapier, and they told me, in quotes, Zapier makes you happier, which is much better than you get the idea. Trello also has some of its own automations. Uh, there's a feature called Butler and a whole bunch of other power-ups that you can explore, and you can tie them into all sorts of different things like scheduling software and things like Google Calendar, things like that. And again, the other apps like Asana and Monday, they all have really good features that might make sense for you and your show setup, but I just wanted to explain to you how I do it. Your mileage, as they say, may vary. And with that, I'm going to drop this episode in the done column and call it a show. Thanks for dealing with my voice and thanks for listening to good morning podcasters. You can catch every episode at goodmorningpod.com. Please consider following the show and your pod player that you most prefer. As you know, very well, because you're a podcaster, all you have to do is click that follow button, click the bell. If you want notifications and watch for this show to come out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I'm also hoping to have an episode of podcasting sucks with Jeff Townsend out soon. Those come out on Saturday mornings but we'll see where the world takes us. Otherwise, have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you Monday right here on Good Morning Podcasters. Good morning, podcasters. Let's talk about how to make the links you share on social media look better. Welcome to the 30th episode of the all new Good Morning Podcasters. My name is Fuzz Martin, and each week I bring you three episodes dedicated to helping you get better at marketing, advertising, PR, and social media as those things relate to podcasting. If you listen to last Friday's show, which actually came out on Saturday morning, you'll know that I am getting over the flu, and while I feel a lot better, I'm still not 100%, and that's mostly coming through in my voice. But the show must go on. It doesn't really need to go on. Like you, I could have really taken some time off for rest, and I'm sure you would have been fine with that, but I like podcasting, and I like my routine, so let's get into it. Do you know what the term open graph means? Open graphs are meta tags that work behind the scenes on a website page. So when somebody shares a link to a page with proper open graphs on social media, those open graphs are retrieved and the preview for that page looks great. When there are no open graph tags, the preview usually looks like garbage. You get a little square to the left usually with an oddly cropped image or a broken image, and then some text on the right, and it just looks ugly and mailed in. People are more likely to interact with a good-looking link, and therefore that link is more likely to perform better on social media, specifically in the algorithms, because the algorithms like posts that are getting clicks and likes. The Open Graph protocol was actually created by Facebook in the early 2010s, 
And then a few years later, Twitter, LinkedIn, and other social networking sites adopted them as well. There are four real types of open graph tags that are required when a link is shared on social media. The first is the title. So this would be the title of your page as you want it to appear on social media. It shouldn't be any longer than 60 characters. So if you're using a regular title tag on your website, you've got your your title there. Your social tag should be 60 characters or less so that it doesn't get cropped when you share that title on social media. The type, that's the second kind of open graph tag that's required. This is the type of content. Usually you'll use website for everything unless it's a article. And if you're using an article, then you'd use the article tag. So it's either article or website. If you're using some plugins like Yoast or SEO Press, they'll give you the option to toggle that. The third required type is image. And that's the one we're going to talk about a bit more coming up. But the open graph image is the preview image that people are going to see when your link is shared. This one is the most visible, you know, since it's an image. And this is the one you should care the most about. And again, we'll talk more about that coming up in a few moments. And the fourth required tag is the URL tag. So obviously the URL that is being shared. You should use the canonical tag, and I'll provide a link uh, to Ahrefs that you can read more about on how to use the canonical tag with your URL open graph tag. One other important tag, though it's not required, is the OG description tag. You get a very limited snippet of text below your image when you share a link on social media. If you use the open graph description tag, you can make sure that the text is written to connect to those seeing that post on social media specifically. There are a whole bunch of other types of open graph tags as well, but those that I've mentioned are the most important for your social posts. So now let's discuss open graph images. Again, the open graph image tag, when used correctly, will make your images look great whenever your link gets shared on Facebook in particular, but also LinkedIn, Twitter, Slack, Post News, Mastodon, MySpace, I got nothing. Your open graph image should be 1,200 by 630 pixels. It needs to be less than 5 megabytes, though. You should never really have images that are 5 megabytes big on your website page ever. That'll kill your site load speed. So don't do that. Make that as small as you can make it while still having good quality. Your image should be branded, relevant to your episode. You could always just have one site-wide open graph image if this is something that you don't want to do for every single episode, but just know that when you share that, it'll be the same image that's shared every time a link to your website is shared. But you want a 1200 by 630 image. I try to make them customized for each episode that I do. Everything's the same. I just change the title and maybe swap in a different background image or color. So how do you install and edit open graph tags on your website. It really varies from site to site, but if you're in WordPress, I recommend installing the free version of the Yoast plugin. This will take care of that for you. Then you can scroll to the bottom of any new post that you create. You click on the word social inside the Yoast SEO box, and then you can edit your open graph title, description, and image. In there, if you edit the Facebook area, and this goes for any site, you should be good pretty much on any social media platform. But I forgot to mention this earlier. Twitter has created its own protocol called Twitter Cards. It's pretty much the same thing, though slightly different. Twitter's preferred image size is 800 pixels by 418 pixels. But if you scale that up by one and a half, it comes out to 1200 by 627 instead of 1200 by 630. So you're three pixels off. It'll be okay. Also, if your Twitter card information isn't available, Twitter will just default to your open graph tags anyway. So I've only used specific Twitter cards a handful of times in my life. You should be fine with open graph standard images and open graph tags unless you really want different image or different text on Twitter specifically. Or if Elon changes something on us, which he is wont to do. If you're using Squarespace to edit your Open graph image, just go to page settings, go to social image, and then upload. If you're on Wix, you can edit this in the social sharing settings area of a post. That's a bit of a tongue twister. And if you're using podcastpage.io, 
Once your episode has gone live, click edit, scroll all the way to the bottom of the page. There's a little edit pencil button next to advanced SEO settings. Click that, and then you can edit your SEO title, description, and image, which includes the social sharing image. I've been starting to ask as many connected people as possible to make updates to the podcast RSS protocol to include open graph images in the RSS feed. So this can be an automated process with websites. We'll see if anybody's listening. Are you listening? Please include the open graph image in our podcast RSS feeds. Thank you. You're spending a lot of time putting out great content for your show. It only makes sense that your web content is as good looking as possible. And when you share an episode or your website or an article from your website on social media, that it looks great and you're getting good interaction with your page. There are few things that make me cringe more than when somebody posts a link to their website on social with a broken open graph image or even an ugly image. Make yourself some 1200 by 630 pixel open graph images and make sure they're properly installed on your site. I've got links to the Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn post validators and inspectors on goodmorningpod.com, or you can check the show notes. That'll do it for today's episode of Good Morning Podcasters. If you found this episode helpful, please consider giving me a five-star review on your preferred pod platform. Also, please consider following the show and telling your friends who podcast about GMP. Thanks again. We'll talk to you on Wednesday right here on Good Morning Podcasters. Good morning, podcasters. Let's talk about a couple of different types of advertising. Hello, I'm Fuzz Martin, and this is Good Morning Podcasters. Thank you for joining me today on the 31st episode of GMP. On today's episode, I'm going to discuss advertising strategies, particularly awareness versus intent. We'll talk about what those terms mean and how they're important to your podcast. But first, I'm going to give you an example of awareness advertising. Today's episode is brought to you by podcastpage.io. If you have a podcast, you need a website. Podcast Page is an easy and intuitive platform that allows you to create a full podcast website in basically no time at all. The platform syncs to your show's RSS feed and automatically creates new episode-specific pages every time you release a new episode. It even works with your YouTube channel. It also imports reviews. It has subscribe icons for all the major podcatchers. It comes with the ability to create a full blog, guest profile pages, intake forms, contact forms, a voicemail widget. They've got beautiful designs and templates and a drag-and-drop editor. Podcastpage.io will have your show's website up and running quickly without costing you a lot of time or money that you would spend on other web platforms. Go to podcastpage.io and get started today. Thank you to Podcast Page for sponsoring today's episode of Good Morning Podcasters. So do you see how that works? I was making you aware of a brand. Awareness is pretty simple to understand as it relates to advertising. It refers to the extent to which consumers or listeners are familiar with your brand, product, service, or say, your podcast. This can include something as basic as knowing about your show, being familiar with it, or even being able to recall specific details about your show. That's awareness. The goal of awareness campaigns in advertising is to increase familiarity, in this case with your show, and make it top of mind for your potential listeners. When it comes to an awareness campaign to promote your podcast, that could include things like promo swaps, network ads, banner ads, Facebook and Instagram ads, billboards, uh, television, radio, 
any sort of mass media or advertising newspaper, <laughs> anything you want to do to reach a wide audience that does not likely know about your podcast. Conversely, pretty much any of the advertising that you do on your show. So your host read ads, interviews you do with different people who are trying to sell something, whether that's a service or a book or an upcoming event, programmatic spots that you may run in your show through your hosting platform. Those are all examples of awareness advertising. Intent, on the other hand, is how we describe advertising or marketing toward people who are already in the know and ready to take action. Or as we might say, they intend to take a specific action. Goals of an intent-based campaign would be to get a potential listener to take the next step toward becoming an actual listener, whether that's by going to your website or going to your Apple Podcasts page. Let's give an example of what we would call a potential listener that would benefit from intent-based advertising. Let's say... There's somebody out there who's fully aware that there is a thing called true crime podcasts that exist in the world, and that person really enjoys them. And let's say they go to Google and search for a new true crime podcast to listen to. They might type in true crime podcast or type in new true crime podcasts 2023 into their search bar. Well, you as a newer true crime podcaster would not be able to compete with those who have established true crime shows because there are so many out there. And those shows might have been featured on NPR or New York Times. They may just be huge. And therefore, those established shows, SEO will likely blow yours out of the water and the results for your show would likely be buried deep. However, you could skip the line and create some Google search ads for those types of keywords. Now your ads will be served to those who are typing in the keywords you want because they intend to listen to a true crime show and they've typed that into their Google search bar. Or let's say somebody already came to your website, looked around for a bit, but never clicked the play button or they never clicked off to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods, etc. With retargeting and conversion tracking, you could serve display ads to them wherever they go on the internet, essentially, to remind them of their previous intent and get them to come back to your site. There are also some ads called lead generation ads or lead gen ads that are designed to get people to sign up for things like your newsletter, provide their information for a giveaway or sweepstakes, or for some sort of demo. Those are all examples of intent or consideration advertising. And also when someone signs up for your emails, they have the intent to follow your show and are likely to listen to your show. So that would be considered intense advertising as well when you send out an email to that group. If you're going to advertise your podcast, which style of advertising should you choose? Well, it depends. The right answer is probably a mix. I advertise Good Morning Podcasters through Reddit ads on subreddits like our podcasting or our Adobe Audition, because I know the people who are in those subreddits are there with the intention of finding information about podcasting and audio editing, those kinds of things. So to me, that would be considered intent advertising. I basically know who those people are and why they're there in that spot at that time. I also run ads on Facebook and Instagram to a wider audience of people who are likely not on those sites looking for information about podcasting, but have podcasting as an interest. Because that's a wider audience that I want to become familiar with Good Morning Podcasters, I would consider that awareness advertising. And there's obviously gray area in between all of those. Your strategy should always start with your goal and then use a mix of tactics to get there. If you want to increase newsletter signups, definitely going to be intent-based advertising. You want to increase awareness about your show? Obviously, it's in the title, Awareness Advertising. I'll just put this out there. If you ever have a question about advertising, or if you ever want me to give you some advice on what kind of advertising you should be spending your money on, feel free to shoot me a DM on Twitter, at GM Podcasters, or you can email me, 
fuzz at goodmorningpod.com. And if I can, I'll help point you into the right direction. That'll do it for today's episode of Good Morning Podcasters. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, please consider dropping a five-star review on Good Pods, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, or just, you know, draw five stars on a whiteboard and send me a photo. That makes me feel good. It makes me feel like what I'm doing is working. Also, be sure to follow the show if you're not already. New episodes come out Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And speaking of Friday, I'll speak to you on Friday right here on Good Morning Podcasters. Good morning, podcasters. Let's talk about merch. Howdy, y'all. I hope you're having a great Friday. Happy Friday the 13th. Hope it's not too spooky for you. (laughs) Sorry. My name is Fuzz Martin, and this is Good Morning Podcasters, a show where we explore marketing, advertising, public relations, and social media topics as they connect to the podcasting industry. And more importantly, how you can connect them to your podcast. The idea for this show is to provide you with practical, actionable ideas. I have no place for gurus or those who want to pump you up and make you feel good. I'm a doer. I want you to be able to do. So let's do. Today, I want to talk to you about merchandise. So here's what we're going to discuss. One, do you need merch? Two, is it worth it? Three, what kind of merch should you get? And four, how do you do it? It'll be pretty high level. Sound good to you? Sounds good to me. Let's get into it. Do you need merch? Let me answer that question with some questions. Is your audience asking for merch or do you just want to have some merch for yourself? Who is going to purchase your merch? Where are they going to wear your merch? Will merch help others start listening to your show? Do you know anyone with a podcasting t-shirt? Do you know anyone who wears podcasting t-shirts besides Ed Kennard of the greatest song ever sung poorly podcast? Depending on the size of your audience base and the rabidness of your audience, it might be a good idea, but it also might not. Podcast merchandise might also be good if you're, say, going to a conference or trade show, speaking at an event, if you have a local presence, or if you have a nationally recognized show. So number two, is it worth it? Is having merchandise for your show worth the money and time involved in getting it up and running. It might be, but you need to be careful. Here are some things that I recommend you look out for. Number one, unless you have a crazy large following and brand and you know that people are itching to get your hands on that brand, don't buy merchandise in bulk. You don't want to have a garage or a basement full of boxes of t-shirts in Size medium, small, large, extra large, double XL, etc. You don't want those sitting around molding in your basement. Little anecdote for you. I run a nonprofit. I was convinced to purchase a bunch of t-shirts for a fundraiser, which was a great event. And we raised a ton of money. We also spent $2,600 on approximately 275 t-shirts, and I have approximately $2,000 worth of t-shirts left. It's not a good place to be, and you don't want to be there with your show. So I highly recommend not buying a whole ton of merch in bulk unless you know that you have the audience that is going to support and move that. And how do you know? You'll know. Or you can just ask them, do a survey, do a pre-order. And number two, and is it worth it? You need to be sure that your audience is clamoring for merch. It's typically a low margin product. So unless you can sell t-shirts at 30 bucks a piece or move a lot of volume, 
the upfront work might not be worth your time. All right, third question. What kind of merch should you get for your show? The type of merch you should perch completely depends on your audience, your genre, your podcast's brand personality, et cetera. Some like overarching ideas are, you know, of course, T-shirts, stickers, hoodies, coffee mugs, water bottles. There are hundreds of different ideas and thousands of different ideas. And depending on your show, there might be some custom items that might make sense for your audience. Let's say you're on a podcast about beer. I'm looking at you, Dave, from Beer in Front. You could create custom can koozies. I'd buy one of those. My wife has an education podcast. She often speaks at conferences. We've created notebooks for teachers with the show's logo on them, and they're a big hit. So depending on your audience and your topic could be some great ideas. Get creative with it. People love free stuff. Just make sure that they're going to use it and that it also might help others find your show. It's all about discoverability, right? And finally, how do you get your merch created? Again, unless you have thousands of listeners each month, I don't recommend buying a boatload of merch and hoping it sells. You might get caught holding the bag and left dropping off giant boxes of your podcast here t-shirts at Goodwill. Instead, I recommend starting with a print-on-demand service. With a print-on-demand service, you will get less margin per item, but you won't have to worry about storing inventory, or even shipping that inventory when it sells. The items are made by the drop shipper and shipped directly to your listener on demand. There are a number of print-on-demand sites out there with good catalogs. I've used two, and I've been happy with both of them. Threadless has a very easy-to-set-up store you can create and point your listeners to. The merchandise quality is okay. It's serviceable. It's good. I've got a hoodie from there that I wear all the time, and it's about four years old. It's worn out, but it's comfy. The other site that I use very regularly is Printful. Printful is cool because it will connect with WordPress, Squarespace, Shopify very easily. It also connects with Etsy, Wix, eBay, Weebly, Amazon, a whole bunch of others as well. Printful has a great catalog of products that you can choose from, both for screen printing type or digital printing type products or embroidery. And they've got hundreds of easy to follow videos that will help you get started. And you can even get a store. You could have a store up and running in 15 minutes. Soup to nuts, as they say. You get to set the price for your merchandise on Printful and how much markup you want to receive. They calculate the shipping, and then you can customize your invoices, uh, the tags on clothing, your confirmation emails, all to wrap your brand up. The only real problem I see with Printful is that you have to sell shirts at a pretty steep price in order to make any money. But if you want your fans to be able to get merchandise about your show, and you don't want to pay anything up front, or you don't want to have a stock of product on hand, then I think Printful is the right store for you. When it comes to design and what your show's merchandise should look like, that's a whole nother episode. There are a ton of different ways you can go with that. Maybe we'll talk about that on a future show. That will do it for today's episode of Good Morning Podcasters. If you have questions for the show, I am very accessible. Email me, fuzz at goodmorningpod.com. That's fuzz, F-U-Z-Z, at goodmorningpod.com, or shoot me a DM on Twitter, at GM Podcasters. New episodes on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Have a wonderful weekend, and I will talk to you Monday right here on Good Morning Podcasters. Thank you for checking out this episode of Andy Podcaster. I really do appreciate it. If you're interested in learning more about this podcast, you can go to podcastfather.com. If you're interested in all the different kind of work that I'm doing, you can go to jefftownsend.media. Contact form on there, various other different podcasts and projects that I'm involved in that I think you will enjoy. 
But again, thank you for supporting me and make sure you support Indie Drop-In Network like we covered in the beginning. Get your podcast featured on there. Until I see you next time, take care of yourself and keep being you and keep being great. Jeff Townsend Media. CG, good night. And the question is, do I stay here? Will you be back? Are you going to come back? Will you be back? Are you coming back?